welcome to our very first episode of Pages and Positivity, our online book club. Thank you for joining us. Yes. It's good to be here for our first episode. We have, we look all official now. Exactly. Please enjoy this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. all right. So let's introduce ourselves one more time in case you can't read the bottom of your screen or uh, didn't join us for the first round. I'm Gabby. I am the young adult librarian here at Hedberg Public Library. And I'm Claire. I am the innovation librarian here at Hedberg. Awesome. And we're here today to talk about books, libraries, book world, all those fun things. And we definitely want you to talk with us. So feel free to chat with your comments and questions. We'll be sure to acknowledge them and include you guys so that it is a discussion without having to leave your house. I hope you're enjoying your sweatpants. Yes. We're still at work and not wearing sweatpants, so. Yeah, that's okay, because we're nice and cozy with our cup of tea. It works. What are you drinking today, Claire? Uh, today I have a nice, fine Earl Grey. Lovely. Yes. Drinking an elderberry, trying mm. to fight off some cold symptoms. Yeah, definitely feel that. So, it's hope okay. everyone's staying happy. <laughs> right. So, should we jump right in? Let's jump right in. All right, uh, for this month's episode, we are talking about Black History Month which is nationally recognized in February. And we're gonna take that in a lot of different directions today when we mostly talk about why representation matters yep. uh, in books, in libraries, and all that fun stuff. So. Yeah, I think we should definitely start talking about um, our wonderful article and podcast, it was podcast, yes. that we listened to with Dr. Carla Hayden, yes. who is the Librarian of Congress. Yep, and Dr. Hayden is the first female and the first African American to serve in the Library of Congress position. Yes. And she is amazing and doing amazing things. So she was recently featured on the Scholastic Reads podcast as their guest. Um, talking about why representation matters. Um, as we talk about a lot of our things today, they come from articles, news sources, podcasts. We'll be sure to link to all of those in our comments, and you can also find those on our YouTube page after our streaming. Absolutely. Um, they're really quick reads, and they're really fascinating reads, too. Um, definitely reading a lot of really fun stuff. Yes. Uh, so there was a couple of uh, really fun things that I had picked out of that article with Dr. Hayden. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite one was the concept of, if you've ever like read anything about children's lit, there's always the concept of uh, windows and doors. Windows and mirrors. Windows and mirrors. Yep. Yes, um, that concept of being able to look into someone else's life, fix, see how their life is, what else is going on there, uh, but also mainly this this big push to create mirrors within mm -hmm. literature, um, so people can open up books and start seeing themselves, especially teens. Um, this is more prevalent in the YA world, yeah. uh, hence all of our amazing literature <laughs> we have today, uh, with that concept of creating new experiences and sharing your stories and, and creating that mirror. So even if you're sitting at home, whether it's in Brooklyn or here in small Wisconsin, <laughs> you still are able to see yourself in right. that situation. So I really love, and I don't have her words in front of me, but paraphrasing, uh, Dr. Hayden was saying how we teach children and young people that books and reading are so important and you can learn and experience anything through reading. But if you are not seeing yourself in this really important media and this really important tool, mm -hmm. you might start to think that you're not important. Mm -hmm. And that's why there is a really big push um, of creating that representation, so those mirrors. And a really important part of those mirrors is that they are authentic and accurate. Mm -hmm. So not perpetuating stereotypes or just putting in any story with a diverse color to it, um, but making sure that they're real. And yeah, we're seeing a lot of that lately, which is great. More mm -hmm. and more voices are coming through, which is amazing and super critical. Yeah, and a whole variety of different voices too, which is really yes. super exciting. Um, and like being able to see different, um, different versions of that too, mm -hmm. um, where it's not just one type of narrative that's being told, it's many different versions and hundreds of different settings, which is very exciting. Um, uh, especially, it reminds me of when I got to go see Saba Tahir in <gasps> Milwaukee. So jealous. Yes, who is um, the author of the Ember in the Ashes series. And um, it was really fascinating talking to her about when she first saw the concept art for her covers. She got very excited because she's like, there's a brown girl on the cover. 
And, you know, the original concept art was, you know, the the fantasy, like, castles and flames and things like that. But, like, no, there was actually real people. Yeah, real representation of her characters, Mm -hmm. of the people, um, and making sure that, like, that is now a new thing. Uh, Right. You can see from a lot of the different covers that we have here of, you know, that was kind of a big step and, like, a huge trend right now is, like, actually representing your characters and your people and your readers on the cover (laughs) of what they're reading. Yes, bring them in, right? We always, we know the good old saying is don't judge a book by its cover, but why else are you going to make it so cute? Of course that's how we do it. Right. (laughs) Exactly. Um, Do you want to share some CCBC stats? Absolutely. Well, representation? Yeah. So in one of the concepts of creating windows and mirrors, um, the, I'm going to pull this up because it's, statistics and numbers, and I don't want to get it wrong. (laughs) So the Cooperative Children's Book Center is a research library associated with the School of Education at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And every year they track and publish their annual statistic on multicultural literature in publishing. And they focus on children's and young adult literature, so everything from zero to that 18 range. They've been doing this statistic keeping for a very long time. They are a very amazing, um, what is the word? Institution? There we go. Uh, They do a lot of really great work coming out of there, so be sure to check them out. But we do want to share that the most recent statistic is their 2018, um, their 2019 stats will be coming out in March, preview. Um, so of the books that the CCBC receives, they receive books from all over, I mean, the world, really. Yeah. Uh, mostly U.S. publishing, but they received 3,653 children's books in 2018. So then of those books, they keep statistics on who is being represented and who is doing the representing. So in 2018, of those 3,000 some books, 405 of those books were about African-American characters, and 202 of those 3,000 books were written by African-American authors and voices. So that's when we talk about being able to Mm -hmm. write your own story and seeing your representation, and luckily this number is increasing for a good while now. It's been increasing over the few years, Um, but really emphasizing the importance of being seen in the things you are reading. Mm -hmm. So, and then also like not being afraid to tell your story. Um, yes, it's like the L article that we read. Um, we read some good articles, guys. Oh my goodness, they're fantastic. <laughs> um, talk about great voices, like uh-huh. listening and reading interviews with some yes. of these amazing authors. Um, you know, uh, reading different things, and um, oh my goodness, who said it? But there was, um, oh, it was Acevedo. Um, where Acevedo had said, growing up, I was always searching for brown girls and black girls in literature that felt like they were written with love. Yes, and I love love that. that. That's so sweet and endearing, too, Mm -hmm. but it's one of those where it's it's written with a purpose and meaning, not just to fill a quota or to make Mm -hmm. it, you know, appear on a certain list, but, like, they really mean it. And so when she says Acevedo, that is Elizabeth Acevedo, the author of The Poet X, which won a whole bunch of awards, because it is amazing. Um, Listen to the audiobook. Yes. Listen to it. Her audio is always really great, too. Her most recent book is With the Fire on High, Mm -hmm. and she has a book coming out May? May. June? Summer. Summer (laughs) Summer-ish. I think it's called Clap When You Land. It's May. It's May. There we go. And we're very excited for that, too. Mm -hmm. So, but again, that just looking for those really authentic and real voices. Mm -hmm. And I also love, um, so this is the L article. We'll, again, be sure to link to that. So this article features voices of change. Uh, So they interviewed five female African-American authors Mm -hmm. uh, who are prominent in YA, so young adult literature. And I do want to preface that even though we're talking mostly about young adult books today, you do not have to be a teenager to read them. They are for so many people and they hit on so many important and just really good topics and they're they're really fun to read right so i mean i would argue they also like are able to freely more express there you go certain topics exploring different things because teens are willing to take a few more liberties with their imagination so when you're an adult and you're reading it you know you don't have to have that like 
adult, you know, yeah, you higher, don't have to put that, that adult higher, hat like, on of like, yeah. I'm so serious. We are not serious. Like, can you tell? <laughs> I know. I feel like adult folks, like everyone has to have something figured out. <sighs> Who does that? Exactly. Like, no, tell everything has ways. to work out because it's perfect and we have to be mature about this. Where a teen is like, I don't know what's going I'm on. I'm it out and the world is ending <laughs> and I'm going to defeat this dragon while I figure it out. Yes. It's great. Anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Back so, to the Amazing L article. <laughs> the voices that they're talking about today are Tony Edayemi, um, who is the author of the amazing, is it the Orisha? Orisha? Yes. Orishi. Orishi. Mm. I think. Children of Blood and Bone, because I feel really <laughs> terrible saying things I should know wrong. Um, and the sequel, uh, Children of Virtue and Vengeance, came out late last year. So mm. I haven't read through that one yet, so no spoilers in the yeah. comments. Okay, great. Uh, but Children of Blood and Bone just got a movie deal. Yeah, so it did. that's exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also talking about Akweke Amezi, who is award winning book uh, Pet. So does amazing things. Some of the other ones are Elizabeth Acevedo, like we mentioned, um, Angie Thomas. You know her from The Hate You Give and her newest one, On the Come Up. They're somewhere mind. down there. <laughs> I went to go pull a lot of these books from our shelves, and I was like, <laughs> where are they? And then I was like, they're checked out, and that is definitely where I want them to be. Yep. Be in the hands of the readers. <laughs> um, and also Nick Stone. So those are some of the ones who are around us today. Some of the amazing quotes we have from them. God, they just had such good things to say. Like, every single one of them. I just want to I just want to read you the whole yeah. thing, but you can do that yourself. I definitely <laughs> should see the article just for Angie Thomas' smile. Oh, geez. Just, like, it will brighten your day. Yes, I love so, it's so good. all of these people. <laughs> they are so great. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to decide, like, which quote to share, right? Right? Because there's so many that really... <laughs> so oh. many. So we can, we can keep talking about Elizabeth Acevedo. Yeah, for I real. really loved, again, we're quoting here, so, um, looking forward to the day when work like hers is the rule and not the exception. Mm -hmm. So when we shared the CCBC t uh, statistic, all of the, they take it down again, mostly by racial diversity. Mm -hmm. um, so they do like Asian Pacific American, Native American and First Nations, um, and Latinx, as well as the African and African American. But the other grouping in that is white. Mm -hmm. White or teddy bears, typically. Like there's a lot of bear books. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> mostly in picture books, let's clarify that. Yep. yep. Um, but having where it's, more balanced, right? Mm -hmm. And it should be reflective of the society that we live in, those yeah. voices and experiences. So I really love when she, she doesn't want to be just the, you know, the notable ones. Like it should be so many of these mm -hmm. are experiencing that. Right. Yes. And then Angie Thomas has the, mm -hmm. I'm trying to remind myself anytime I enter a space that I'm supposed to be there. And that exactly. is so powerful. And to spread that message of you belong here. You deserve to take up space in the world and our narrative and your story is important. Yeah. And, and so like, are you. You are important too. And not being afraid to tell that story mm -hmm. because it needs to be told. Yeah. Um, she has a quote when she's referring to um, The Hate You Give was challenged this last year for being yes. anti-cop. Yep. Um, and she has the quote of, it's frustrating because you're basically telling young people, if this book is about you, your life makes me uncomfortable. Right. And it's like, but that's the reality we live in. It's like, yes, we can have wonderful, fantastic stories with great values and virtues, like in Children of Blood and Bones, mm -hmm. that beautiful mythos, but then re comparing it to The Hate You Give, where this is very real situations of, like, very real s what's going on in these kids' lives. Right. Um, There's always that push to, like, protect kids from the things that are yeah. hard, protect them from the scary things. Um, and we sometimes want to do that to ourselves, you know, pretend problems don't exist, mm -hmm. but that doesn't help make the problems change mm -hmm. or make them go away. It doesn't provide solutions. Yes. So yes. she calls you out. Like, you yeah. can't be uncomfortable because it's real. Yeah. If you're uncomfortable, find a way to, to help, to fix it. Yeah. Um, and to acknowledge those voices that are dealing with that. Exactly. So. And I mean, there isn't, that's not to say that you can't have a little bit of both of that fantasy and realness. Like, mm -hmm. um, oh, I can't remember who wrote it now. But a blade so black, yes, which is a retelling, or it is it's like an urban telling of Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, 
Um, so, you know, she she fights these dark creatures and she's saving the world and, you know, she travels to Wonderland and all this fantasy. But on the same time, she has to, like, you know, she's out saving the world, but she has to talk to her mom and, you know, like, try and convince her that it's okay mm -hmm. because there was someone her age who also had dark skin who randomly got shot by police. So it's like trying to deal with that kind of story. Right. Um, you know, the very real story of living in Atlanta um, and then fusing it with fantasy. So yeah. there's that fine line and yep. being able to tell that, that awesome, authentic story and then have a little fun as well. Yeah. So. so. Is that a thing? That is we, we did a test to learn how to twitch, and I don't know that I did it, and I can't entirely see her computer, but like... Yes, let's see. It's I, a thing. Yes. Uh, we want yes. to talk to you. <laughs> talk to us. All right. It's Busy Bear. Thank you for Hi. joining us. Uh, yes, bears are great, and they do make fantastic children's <laughs> stories. <laughs> and that's why they're also a statistic for the yes. CCBC. Yes. <laughs> All right, and then it looks like Lens545 is here. I know who that is, so hello. Thank you for joining <laughs> us. <laughs> Are you stalking the watch channel? <laughs> um, yes, maybe. All right, we're going to try, and I'm going to be a pro streamer. Watch this. What? Yeah. So I guess that's what our activity feed is. Yeah, but it looks like we have quite a few people um, joining us right now. Unfortunately, I can't see... Um, everyone who's showing up, but it looks like there's 75 of you, so that's exciting. That's a thing! <laughs> so maybe we should, why we're so darn excited. Uh, so we work at a public library. Yeah. Obviously. And yes. this is kind of a new approach to book clubbing. Yeah. Not that that's a word, but I just made it one. Um, it's the greatest kind of clubbing. Right. Book clubbing. <laughs> <laughs> so we're definitely, this is an experiment going through. It is so we're just really excited that you joined us for this experiment. That's why. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and it's also a great way to, you know, talk with other people who are interested in books, who, you know, yeah, just want to chat with us. And you know, sometimes it's hard to, to get out and right. go to an actual book club. Or put on real pants. I mean, yeah, pants. I feel that. Yeah. But <laughs> so we're excited to so be we're here. Really excited that you're joining us. Yes. yes. And keep hitting us with your comments, your questions. Um, we want to bring you into the conversation, too. We... Uh, librarians can often be seen as gatekeepers, but we're not. You know, we're not trying to do that at all. We're trying to help you connect with information, but mm -hmm. also share really cool stuff. And today, that really cool stuff is books. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we have a question from Busy Bear here. Is this your first stream? It is! Yes! We had like a short Don't two minute. Don't judge us too harshly. <laughs> <laughs> we had a two minute test run, but this is our very first stream. Like episode that lasts more than, hello, hello, goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about real things today. Yes, yes. I might actually finish this cup of tea. That's that's how long it's going, yes. right? Um, so yeah, we have a couple more things that we wanted to talk as yes. well. Yes. Um, so we've been talking a lot about writing your own story, telling your own story. So I think it's time that we bring up Jason, Jason Reynolds. Reynolds. Yes. This is where we like insert fangirl noises <laughs> in the background. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, we were joking. Because he's just <laughs> an amazing human being, inside and out. It just yes. everything. We were joking in like minor prep for this. Of we could probably spend the entire hour talking about Jason Reynolds' hair alone. Mm. But I mean, we'll yeah. talk about more. <laughs> so, uh, so a little bit about Jason Reynolds. Of of course, he's a YA author. Yes. Um, so and middle grade. He and has, middle grade. Um, the track series is for that older middle grade, younger teen. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think Look Both Ways is his newest book. And that's yeah. kind of middle grade. Um, is as brave as you considered middle grade fiction? Mm, I think some people do. OK. That in-between-ish. Yeah. But he has, is it 13 titles now? He's got quite a bit. He has a very long, very impressive list. Many, many, many of them are award-winning titles. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Just everything he writes is golden. <sighs> <laughs> yeah. Continue. And he's just, he's wonderful, and he's funny. Okay, he I is. have to share please, from please. his bio. So if you go yes, on, onto okay. his page, Jason writes books. Yep. Um, <laughs> and we'll link to all of that later also. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but he's talking about his life and how we started to get uh, writing. 
And, you know, he says that he, he graduated from the University of Maryland and he was ready to move on and do stuff. Um, and he says, uh, then I packed my bags and moved to Brooklyn because somebody told me that they were giving a, away dream come true vouchers. And if I ever find the person who told me that, <laughs> let's just uh -oh. say knowing one was giving away anything, anything. <laughs> so, he, he, he has such a good sense of humor. Yeah. All of these things. I, most of his, the back of his, the back of his book bios are always like, Jason is crazy about stories. Yes. And it's just so good. It's so good. <laughs> um, so the reason that, one of the reasons that we're bringing him up today mm -hmm. is that he was recently named the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. Yay. It's kind of a big deal. It's a very big deal. He is the eighth person to be in this role, so he succeeds uh, also author Jacqueline Woodson. Mm. She was serving in that role for the last year. Um, and this is a position that is designated by the Library of Congress, and a committee votes and everything like that, nominates and votes. Um, and Jason has been gifted that title for this year. Yeah. So he will be traveling the country um, for 2000, is it 19 to 20? To 21. 21 talking to young people about literature. Mm -hmm. And his platform is a little unique uh, for the position because his platform is called Grab the Mic, and it is all about empowering these kids to tell their stories. Not just read them, but tell their own. Mm -hmm. And how the telling of your story and the opportunity to do so is so powerful. And really being able to take advantage of that. Um, so it'll be really exciting to see to see what he does with that. Yeah. Um, very excited. Yeah, especially with the StoryCorps background. Yes. Um, so if anyone and is... he's partnering is, with them for this, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's working with, with StoryCorps. And uh, b before he started writing or before, you know, he, he started taking off, um, he was a StoryCorps facilitator. And if you're not familiar with StoryCorps, mm -hmm. um, it's like this huge project that I think came out of California. Does that sound right? I think San Francisco. I'm going to go with sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Fact check choices. <laughs> um, but um, basically their their whole thing is like trying to create like this library of human stories. Um, I think Humans of New York kind of started as that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just like going up to real people and trying to get their story. And, and Jason Reynolds worked doing that. And now it's like his whole platform. Right. But it's even cooler because he's talking to kids about it. Yes. Like no one really goes up to a kid and says, hey, your life is super important. I yeah. want to hear everything Tell that happened about, about your it. day. Um, it's just, it's going to be so cool to see what he gets out of this. Extremely. I'm so excited. So we want to share a little bit about the release about his nominee, uh, well, his winning that. Mm -hmm. So why Jason, right? There are right. so many great voices who are doing all of this writing for kids and teens. Um, so the, I will read directly from the release because the national ambassador is selected for his or her contributions to young people's literature. You can see that around us, he's contributed a lot of things. The ability to relate to children and teens and dedication to fostering children's literacy in all forms. Mm -hmm. um, were you at the CCBC lecture when he was the speaker? Do you remember that a couple years ago? I don't think I made it. I made okay. it to Jacqueline Woodson, but I yes. did not make it to Jason Reynolds. Okay. So Claire and I went to grad school together. Hello, high school. <laughs> We're doing things with our degrees. Ha <laughs> We're really excited about that. <laughs> um, and we are lucky enough to have the Cooperative Children's Book Center, which we mentioned before, on our campus. Mm -hmm. And they host the Charlotte Zolotow Award and Lecture every year. So Jason won this award a few years ago, and then he came to give a speech on it. Uh, and it was free and open to the public, which is super exciting. But one of the coolest parts about that evening was that the local librarians and schools and community leaders, people, made really amazing efforts of getting um, children, like middle grade and teens mm -hmm. of African American background, to be able to be there. And they had the front row was just for them. And there was this moment where I can't remember the entire part of it, but he's talking about the, the language that he uses in his books, mm -hmm. right? And I think part of it was something along the lines of, I'd be going to get some food of some sort, right? But it was the using the word be uh, in this uh, like technically incorrect way. Right. And he's looking at me, he goes, 
I use it because sometimes I just want to say B and they're all cracking up and just so engaged with him and it's it's like they were the only ones in the room so he definitely relates mm -hmm. he's he's so amazing and just really honors those kids <sighs> I'll just remember all it mm. <laughs> I'll just be here daydreaming about Jason it's fine <laughs> I can't remember what I was doing during then, but I know it wasn't important enough now <laughs> <laughs> to be missing Jason. I'm missing Jason Reynolds. <laughs> oh, nothing is uh, ever important enough. Yeah. Um, we'd also like to talk a little bit about one of his more recent projects. Um, again, this article was actually published today. Nope, the 24th technically, but I came across it today. <laughs> yeah, scrolling. Uh, so the School Library Journal published an interview of Nicole Hannah-Jones, who is an investigative journalist, uh, and she talked to Jason Reynolds, who we already told you all about, mm -hmm. and then Ibram X. Kendi. Mm -hmm. uh, so Dr. Kendi is an academic writer. Um, some of his more well-known books would be um, How to Be an Anti-Racist and Stamped from the Beginning. And Stamped from the Beginning is what he and Jason are kind of partnering on, taking and turning into this young adult book. So their book will be called Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You. Mm -hmm. And this is a super amazing, relatively longer interview, but there is a small back and forth that we would love to read you. How to do that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's our um, because it really, <laughs> it will make you melt because it just really tells you what Jason does and how intentional he is with everything he writes. Mm -hmm. um, so this is from the article from their script. Um, so Hannah Jones asked the question um, to talk about how it feels to be a writer, particularly a black writer right now. And Reynolds' response is, for me, I'm always thinking about who I'm in conversation with and am I working in tradition? That does matter to me, but only in the instance that I'm moving and pushing and evolving said tradition, creating new traditions within said tradition. So he's really trying to just further that conversation of what's already going on because African Americans and just like life in general are not stuck in the past, right? We tend to uh, separate ourselves from their struggle and their story and it's it's not. It's now, it's always, yep. and it continues. Um, so the rest of it says, so I feel really humbled and held accountable for what I'm making, for who I am making it for and to make sure that I'm honoring the people who have come before me and to make sure that I'm making space and seats at the table for the people coming after me. So it's special. And then Hannah Jones follows that up with, so who are you writing for? And this is, this is the best moment. <laughs> Reynolds says, I write for black children. It does not mean that black children are the only people who read my books, obviously, but they are who I have in mind when I'm working. I want to write something that is for them and about them that speaks the language that they know, that does not need to be explained, that is woven into swaths of our culture to make sure that they feel emboldened, that they feel seen and visible and big and human. Mm. And that's so amazing. Yep. We're gonna clap for Jason. We clap love you. Jason. We love you. We love you. Uh, they Watch our stream. <laughs> <laughs> Hi Jason. <laughs> Marry me. It's fine. <laughs> Maybe don't watch. <laughs> uh, so their collaboration piece will be coming out in early March. Uh, and Jason reads the audiobook version, so Very excited you're going to want to listen to that. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Second to cool down from those amazing words. Right. I need a, a moment. <laughs> uh, I do love the phrase, the seat at the table. Yes. You know, it's just, that's kind mm -hmm. of like, that's like the big push, especially like in literature and just, yep. you know, being in a global world in general, like it's not enough to open doors and, you know, to, to have opportunities, but offering that seat at the table right. for voices, experience, for other humans to come in. It's so just, that the window and mirror that we talk about, right? Like mm -hmm. the, the window isn't always enough. You need to step into that world and experience it. Yeah. So that... Um, going back to grad school days. Oh man! Um, so long didn't ago. we? There was an article. Jacqueline Woodson wrote it, and mm -hmm. isn't it like a seat at the table? Like, isn't that her thing? Yeah, right. I'm sure like, that's her thing. Until you have come and experienced, mm -hmm. at, you know, eating dinner at my table, mm -hmm. 
that whole thing and just she uses this whole metaphor of like until you dip your bread in our soup and share it with us Mm -hmm. you know then you then you know and then you can say and share and yeah we should try to find that one too yes Maybe. We're we'll going to link that one. We're going to send you all the resources. Because yes. that's, that's what librarians, librarians do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we're going to learn you here. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> what's in your tea, Claire? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's Earl Grey. It's Earl Grey. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, so look, we have someone else here. Modesta. Hi. Thank you for joining us. Hello to you. <laughs> um, and yes, the audiobook for Children of Blood and Bone is amazing. Oh Oh, that was so good. And I can't wait to, to pick up the next book, too. Actually, I need to just reread it. That's what, So I feel like I have to... I got the second book for Christmas. My brother gave it to me. He goes, well, weirdo asks for books. And I'm like, this yeah. one! <laughs> yeah. If you're a weirdo who asks for books for Christmas, too, let us know. I feel you. But I started to read the second book, and I was like, oh, no, it's been so long! <laughs> what what happened? Uh, well, who is this person? And I was like... I'm going to have to reread the first one. Oh, that was the problem. It was Great. such a good book. I, like, so ate it in one sitting. Exactly. And it's like, but then it was an entire year until the next yeah. one came out. Yeah. Mm. I do love the the story. I think it was in the L article where she talks about where she came up with the idea. Yeah. Where she was, like, futzing around with ideas and characters. And then she was at a gift shop yeah. in, somewhere in Italy. Uh, it? She mentions it. Keep talking. I'll find Anyways, where it was. So she was just, like, walking in this gift shop. And she saw this postcard that had this this African deity on yep. it. And she's like, this is it. This is my story. It just, like, came to her fully formed, is yeah. what she says. And it was in Brazil. Brazil. Yeah. And then she said it just, like, appeared so fully yeah. formed and just, it was done. And just I think, like, that's amazing. Epiphany. But I, I really, lo- oh, my God, I just ate that story in two seconds flat. So good. Um. I was all, I'm a really wimpy reader. <laughs> I don't like anything remotely scary. So when I heard the title, I only saw the title. And I was like, oh no, it's gonna be some scary story. And I won't read it, but everybody is talking about all this hype. And I'm like, oh, fine, I guess I'll take a look at it. And I don't think I came out of my room for like an entire day because I was mm-hmm. just finishing it. And also like that summer that it came out, was it Jimmy Fallon announced it as like his summer read? Yeah. And my mom was like, is this the book you're reading? Jimmy just told me to read it too. And I'm like, it's not. Sure, when Jimmy yeah, tells you. Right, when Jimmy tells you, but not your daughter. <laughs> but she was very excited to know. So we'll give her points for that. Yes. Uh, so good. Look at more of my notes. There, I have so I know, many right? like quotes and stuff highlighted. I won't lie, I totally rehearsed this in my mirror a few times. And then I'll transition into this topic. But it's like... Yeah. I could just do this all day. It doesn't really happen with And screens. you can talk to us, too, you know. Yeah, please. Talk free to us. Ask us questions. <laughs> Tell us what uh, you're reading. Yeah. Are you reading anything good right now, Claire? We can do that for a little bit. Yeah. Oh, what am I reading right now? Well, I just <laughs> finished Bla- Blades of ba- Bla- 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 Black. Yes. Um, and right now, I'm reading an adult book. You. Which is weird. <laughs> I'm not actually you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. Uh, I mostly read YA. Right. Um... But no, I've definitely have been reading um, Library of the Unwritten, Ooh. which um, the character is she has darker skin. Um, but that one takes place in it's sort of implied that it's modern day, but the main character is a librarian named Claire. What? Um, but she kind of works at a unique place. Um, she's a librarian in hell. <laughs> 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 and she is the head librarian of the Unwritten Wing, okay. where every author's story goes to basically live in purgatory until the author is ready to write it. Oh my god, I love that. And it's not just, you know, like these shelves of books. <laughs> right. Um, but all these these books occasionally, you know, they decide that they want to have a purpose and they come to life as their characters. Oh so my she has to like hunt them down. <laughs> So she's just like this totally cool, you know, she's got like, she's still ha- like in her, the clothes that she was buried in. So it's like full skirts <laughs> and, she's you know, chasing she's down these chasing characters. down these books that are, they're here. And I feel like the librarian from hell could turn into a really bad nickname. <laughs> Neither of us are that. I We're the cool librarians. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> you won't know. Definitely reminds me of my high school librarian. Oh, uh. 
Let's Are you see. reading things? I can't believe you can see that far away. I I'll can. be honest. <laughs> My super eyeballs. Uh, let's see. Have you read Elizabeth Acevedo? I listened to most yes. of Poet X. It is fantastic, and I've yeah. always been meaning to go back to it because it's just so good. Yes. Um, and it's one of those things where you're like, oh, I didn't realize this was poetry. Yeah, <laughs> so a Poet X is written in verse or poetry. Yeah. Um, and that can lend itself to so many different techniques and styles and just, you know, things come across differently when they're written in poetry. Um, loved that one. Mm -hmm. I also really loved her, her second one. Um, they are unrelated, but With a Fire on High mm -hmm. is about, ooh, the characters' names are not in my head. Um, but there's this teenage girl, and she's a teen mom, but it's not... It's a very different take on the teen mom story because she's very focused, she's very capable, um, and she wants to be a chef. And she has just this, like such a, a gift, right? She has magic hands with food. Um, and she's cooking all these things, and like the recipes and the actual cooking are in the book, which is a really cool oh. kind of inclusion. And I could always just be like, I want someone to cook this for me <laughs> because it sounds amazing. And that one is not written in verse. That one's just narrative. Mm -hmm. and, and just the fact that she can do both styles so well is so amazing. So I'm basically yeah. just really ready for her third one to just magic what she's going to do with that. Yeah. And Jacqueline Woodson is like that, too. Because mm -hmm. I remember, because I went to the Zaltov lecture, and then I, I purchased her book for... <laughs> To, to sign, and I was sitting there flipping through it in line because I had listened to it yeah. and went, "This is poetry." This is poetry? What? Oh, man. What? <laughs> Didn't realize that, so I felt kind of dumb <laughs> just because I had never like looked at the book. Um, but it's such a, a fluid thing, and like yeah. so many people are like, oh, "I hate poetry," blah blah blah. But then you find you know amazing like yeah. narrative poetry mm -hmm. like that, and it's just it changes everything. I yeah. know, like what back in my day. <laughs> Ellen Hopkins was a lot like that. I didn't so read her stuff. It's I it's grew up rough. a little sheltered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely talking about Windows is Ellen yeah. Hopkins there reading, cranked and everything. Those are Good again. Stuff. They need to know. Those are a lot of tough topic books, but yeah. teens need to see that and see consequences, possibilities. Um, and experiences, because again, they're not alone, mm -hmm. and to know that there are there are answers, there are help, there there is help. I can talk. Words are hard. I tell you. <laughs> oh. Let's see. What else are y'all reading? Let's see. Tell us the things. We can talk to each other all day, and that might be entertaining, but we also <laughs> want to talk to you. Exactly. We might go down a rabbit hole of just geeky weird, yes. but you can come with us if you want. Let's see, Busy Bear reading Coding for Python. Hey, Ooh. I just started to, right. to try and do that. As innovation librarian, <laughs> I have to. Uh, Is that like in your job requirement? It's not my job requirement, but it's also <laughs> just something I want to know so you know I can program a Raspberry Pi to do whatever I want. Because as soon as you figure out how to use coding and speak right. in like Python or any other kind of coding language, you can basically do whatever you want. Right. And for the nerds like me, Python is not parcel tongue like Harry Potter. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Though I wonder if you do, if you could code could you in code Python, in if you could qualify yourself as a parcel tongue. I don't know. We'll leave that uh, decision up, up to, to you guys. guys. <laughs> um, let's see. Modesta says uh, Imoni. Was that the name, the character you're thinking of? Yes. There we go. Yeah. It took a second. Yeah. I always find it really <laughs> interesting when so when you read, right, it's a solitary activity. Um, and if you're not listening to it, so when I was reading With the Fire on High, I, in my head I pronounced it as Emony. Okay, great. So when you're like, is, is that the same character? Yes, yes it yes. is. All good things. That was, um, so in kind of preparation for today, again, we totally messed up Tony's series. Sorry, Tony. Um, but let, uh, the importance of like listening to how people pronounce their names. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of interviews with one of our authors that we talked about today, and everybody said it differently, and I was like, <laughs> no! So I was looking for so many interviews and waiting until they said their own name, and I was like, gotcha. And that would be uh, Akweke Emezi, the author of Pet, like we said. But they're awesome. They're doing so many things. And I loved watching all of their interviews. They just talk about it so well and it's oh my goodness 
Yes. It's really great. But yeah. We wanna we wanna do justice to the right things. Yes. Um did you ever see the there's I don't know if it's like a TED Talk concept, but she's kind of giving an interview um, to which Orange is the New Black. Mm-hmm. So the k- actor who plays Suzanne, mm-hmm. do you know her name? I'm trying to remember. Right, I can see it, but I so she makes this whole thing about how she hated her name when she was young because it was so different, right? And nobody could pronounce it correctly. And her mom gave her this like. If they can learn how to say and throwing out all these famous names, if they can learn how to say that, I remember they can I learn saw how that. to say yes. yours. And I think that's so awesome and empowering. Yep. And I was, I really wish I could think of her name. But again, I don't want to do it wrong. But exactly. go watch that YouTube video. Look for Orange is the New Black Sudan. Yeah, <laughs> you'll find a lot of things. <laughs> it's an adult oh. twitch. We're fine. Yeah. <laughs> but that's like, that is such a fun. I I guess not fun. But I don't, it's just one of those things that like kind of blows your mind of like, there are these like amazing names and it's like, mm-hmm. you have to, to give the effort like you would if you're trying to figure right. out. Like, I always hate when people, uh, like teachers or presenters are like, oh, I'm going to butcher this name. So I just won't say it. Like, and then just cop out. Learn, teach me. I will say it over and over again until mm-hmm. I get it right. And it's, that is really important. Um, we were recently at a social justice conference and one of the presenters, one of her stories I think it's a children's book. It's called Teach Me Your Name. Mm-hmm. Um, and she talked a lot about how not only is you know pronunciation important, especially depending on language and the history of the word, um, but also like, why, why? Why are you named that? You know, like where does yeah. it come from? What does it mean? Because a lot of it can have a family story, um, a cultural history, all of those really good things. So like there's so much said in even a name. Yeah. So. I mean, it's like the whole concept th- that we were talking about earlier with like listening to the story and mm-hmm. like making it, it's important. It's what makes you human. It's, yes. it's your name. And if you're not even going to like bother right. to learn to if pronounce If you're not going to give the name, the, name right? the importance, what are you automatically saying about the rest of your story and your identity and. Right. So. So. Definitely. And be willing to look at YouTube interviews. Yes. And just scour the internet. Like people may get it wrong a thousand times, but if they try. <laughs> right. We applaud effort. Yeah. And that's one of those where we are always learning and improving, too. I mean, yeah. Um, I think it's that, like, unspoken thing, but we're going to say it, so now it's spoken, right? Like, we're two white women who are talking about African-American voices and identities, mm-hmm. and we have our own level of experience and privilege that comes with that for us to talk about this. Um, but it doesn't mean, so by no means are we experts, first of oh, all. Oh, no. Not at all. This is not our story to tell. We are just trying to get that story into more places for it to learn and grow and so that you can connect with the people who do tell that story. And, like, so you can be as excited as we are because yes. they are amazing stories. Right. And and voices and just, it's such a, a, a just wonderful gush thing. about it. Gush. <laughs> <laughs> One word fail. <laughs> ah. uh, <laughs> some effects. <laughs> yes. Uh, but like with the the whole name thing, that's mm-hmm. a, a huge thing in a couple of the stories with um, N.K. Jemison. Oh yeah. Um, uh, I think it's the the valedictorian. There's the co- so we in our little preview. If you tuned in for that, we mentioned that we were going to discuss. How Long Till Black Future Month, which is a collection of short stories by N.K. Jemisin. Um, so Claire and I both read this book. Mm-hmm. It is definitely adult fiction, um, but there, there was a lot about the importance of names. Mm-hmm. So, so continue with that, sorry. But I wanted to preview, like, what we're talking about. Right, and it, I, I remember it especially sticking, I believe it was the valedictorian, but there is a young woman in one of her stories where, you know, uh, like her teacher is just like, don't give her the time of day. And right. it's like, it doesn't really matter because you're going to mispronounce gonna say it wrong. You're going to anyway. say it wrong. Yeah. And it like, I felt my heart just like, Ugh, but it's such a beautiful a name. <laughs> yes, because the reader knows it, but between the dialogue, she never mm-hmm. says it. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but there's just so many good stories um, within that as well. Yeah. Bye, Tina. <laughs> <laughs> She's trying to sneak out of here all quietly, but we're just going to say hi. Because she's being amazing and helping us do this. So, thank you. (laughs) Come again. (laughs) 
Uh, I have okay. to. I have to flip through. Oh, the book. Yes. Let's see if it was the valedictorian. Did you have any other standout ones in that that you really liked? I love La Camista. Yes. Okay, I so we were, <laughs> we're like, oh, we should each pick a short story to talk about and share, but we both picked the same short story as our favorite, Yeah. which just says how good it is. Um, I sometimes have a hard time reading short story collections because just as you're getting into it, into that world and learning those characters, then it, it's over and it switches. Um, but I think short stories are really powerful. Like I'm always really impressed with a writer who can do a good short story. Right. Because there's a lot to get through in a very little amount of time and it, everything has to be powerful. Mm -hmm. And like the amount of freedom that, that N.K. Jemisin has in this book, because it's yeah. like magical realism, it's sci-fi, yep. it's apocalyptic. It's and there's like uh, references to what the White Walker, not White Walker, <laughs> Game of Thrones. Uh, the but the white woman mm -hmm. and kind of like the mystical mythology. Blue. Yeah, what are we talking right? Like yeah. it plays on. She just incorporates everything into this book. Yeah, and it's there's like a whole bunch all separately. Um, it's really awesome. I'm trying to think. There's like a lot of like. I don't want to say like to more coworkers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say it's like rewritten history, but it's like alter. It's alter altered history. It's altered right. history that like there's one that takes place like after. Hurricane Katrina. Kind of like during. So the yeah. city is flooding. And then, um, but there's this, is it a mystical beast kind of, right? Like yeah. there's this like lurking creature in the floodwaters. And this creature like instills hatred against other people mm -hmm. um, and really perpetuates, you know, some multiple, multiple issues going on. And, yeah. Oh man. But uh. you know, so as if, what would happen if some of these historic events happened differently and changed? Yeah. Uh. It's just, uh, I think the 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 one with the the white woman who's like, essentially like a vampire succubus yeah. type thing. Um, that one was also. And she, so she steals um, like little African American children, mm -hmm. and like uh, the concept is kind of like she drains their energy and like uses it to keep herself young. Yeah, right. They have like an ounce of magic within them. Yeah. Um, and then she feeds off of that and stays young. Yeah. Um, but just just. Uh, uh, a powerful kind of like narrative right just in, in that um, but there's a lot that can be said in using um, you know mythology and kind of those like fairy tale concepts and mm -hmm. putting them into real world issues and conversations which yeah. is extremely what Tony Adeyemi does yes with her series is you know she puts it in this really um, magical and mythology based world but the lines of conversation are all, you know, they can be put into modern day social justice so easily. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that can be that really good meeting point. You know, if you can understand this topic, then you can understand this other one. Exactly. Um, one thing I do really love about that story, what was it called? I think it's the one before. It's, it's really early in it. Yeah, I think it's right before La Camista. No, because that's... Should we talk about La Camista while we look for it? Yeah, so that one is just really fun because I it's... The detail is amazing. Do not read it on an empty stomach. It Absolutely is not. the food that is made. It's like all mythical. It's all like magical, yeah. right? So um, this woman is working at a fancy hotel in something. She works at like a rundown inn. She, oh, she used rundown. to be like this she you know, used amazing to be a fancy cook chef. Yeah. until she spit on someone who was powerful. Yes, um, who didn't like her food. Yeah. Um, so, but one day this mysterious stranger comes in with a bundle of ingredients and is like, I have been looking for a cook and you are that cook and you're gonna make me this. Um, and it's these like magical mushrooms and herbs and strange meat of unidentified <laughs> origin. <laughs> and she figures out the way to cook it up and he keeps bringing her over and over again, right? So he brings her ingredients, mm -hmm. she makes the meal, he eats it. And then, but the meal like turns him young. And so eventually he's willing to share this magic of like, you can be young too. And uh, and no, it's like the whole concept of like, this is a woman who, you know, she was she was strong and powerful and stood up for what she mm -hmm. believed in um, and like knew she had talent. And then, you know, she like, I guess fell essentially. Right. Um, and then this, you know, the stranger of the night brings her a new opportunity, a new challenge, and now she gets to yeah. live forever and you know, have her summers in August. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but the, the description in that short story is just 
so amazing. I've never had this magical mushroom type thing, but that yeah. sounds pretty good. My yeah, I know. favorite line out of that is like they're talking about, um, you know, like the power in everyday objects and yeah. the, like the power of food um, and things like that. And um, the, the stranger in the night says, because all things contain power, senora, but some have more power than most. Science has only recently discovered the truth, but certain professionals in the world, yours and mine, have known it for centuries. Who is to say plutonium is more powerful than, say, rice? One takes away a million lives, and, one, and the other saves hundreds times as many. That's huge. It's like, talking about like that. those things that, um, you know, uh, like a cook may sometimes be looked down as not the most lofty profession, especially mm -hmm. if maybe you're not a five-star restaurant type of thing. But it's so empowering to, to feed people, right? Like you are yeah. providing life. And this is, it really comes through in the short story of when he eats the meal, he becomes young, like literally renewed and yeah. living just continuously. And that those, those really like arts and talents of providing are, are nothing to be looked down upon. Yeah. And the concept of, like, you know, like, war versus yeah. you know, taking care of yep. your people and... How are you going to take care of? Yes. Right. What is power and who the heck defines it? Exactly. Oh, boy. That's a different rabbit hole. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the story we're talking about is Red Dirt Witch. Red Dirt Witch. That's what it is. I did like that one. Uh, that was the, 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 the white, white woman, woman, succubus. Yeah. And the stealing. Yes. Yeah. I really liked that one. It pulled in a lot of fairy tale mythology. I love the part where Not you know the the you know the the vampire woman is like you can't defeat me. You need like Rowan and all this stuff, and then uh, it's like in the tea and in the dirt, right? Yeah, exactly. But like, she, ha, you know that the the fig tree that it's like you know my family brought this over. Yes, um, roots like literally the roots personified oh. is. Right there in front of you. Yeah. Made really obvious. <laughs> it's right there, that, that whole like melding of it. And it's like, ah, uh, I don't know. The whole thing of like, yes, you have like the Western mythology, but it's just as good as like the African yeah. mythology. And like, I can still defeat you with my history, my roots, what right. I know. It's just, ah. Yes. So I bash myself at the book. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you have to do that. But I really love also the. How the history isn't stuck in the past, you know, the bringing the history yeah. with you, how it is incorporated into everyday life, and how it perpetuates into the future. Mm -hmm. And I think that's huge too. Yeah. Uh, we can we can touch that. Um, so a quick a a quick a um, when in the L article, one of their statements was. Um, using their work as a blueprint for the future. Mm. So not just representing now, but like he, we need to keep moving forward. Um, so their statement is, I wanted to make that exist in a story because if you can start imagining that, you can start imagining black kids in a world without police and without prisons and with different systems of justice. Imagining that is the first step to making it real. Um, and that's, that's awesome because mm -hmm. there's so much of like, you know, if you don't see yourself now, these people wrote themselves into the story, and that's mm -hmm. that's step one. Now write yourselves into the future. Yep. And that's that's so cool. Uh, um, so there is the. Well, we'll do this. This is my other note card because I wrote down a definition. I like to be prepared. So it is considered a cultural aesthetic. Um, the term Afrofuturism. Mm -hmm. Are you guys familiar with this term at all? Yeah. Tell us if you are. <laughs> Just talk to us. <laughs> um, so it's a cultural aesthetic that explores the intersection of African diaspora culture uh, merged with technology. Mm -hmm. So it was coined in 1993 by Mark Deary. Like, yay, good job, dude. Um, but it, it's a reimagining of the future filled with arts and science through a black lens. Uh, we see that a lot in uh, artists like Janelle Monae mm -hmm. with her... Um, what is it like the ro the not robot? She has the kind of cyborg alter yeah. ego, mm -hmm. um, and also things like Black Panther yep. are Afrofuturism defined, yeah. like literally. So the Marvel movie, um, which is, I love seeing those takes on it, and mm -hmm. I'm excited to see that. There's also um, 
Nick Stone, one of our female African American authors that we're talking about today, also she is writing one of the Shuri. Um, is it a graphic novel? She's writing a Shuri story. I don't know what format it's in, um, but the the princess in yeah. Black 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 Panther. I don't think it is. Princess is the wrong word, but you know what I'm saying. She's a princess. It's not a graphic. There is a graphic novel series yes. about Shuri, which is also great. Hi, go read <laughs> because it's wonderful. But I don't know what Nick Stone's um, format is going to be. I don't remember. No, but Nick Stone has been cruising these last few years. Oh yeah. Her first kind of big hype book was Dear Martin. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of came out in the uh, dealing with like police violence mm -hmm. kind of wash that the hate you give kind of spurred. Um, but she has been cruising. She has so many titles out right now. There's yeah. like uh, Jackpot. The odd one out, and those are both YA titles. Um, she has a couple middle grade ones. Like, she's been cruising. I follow her Instagram, and I love her. <laughs> I'm gonna have to follow her on Instagram now. She's great, and she always has super fun colored lipstick and like makeup looks. Yes. And in non-work life, I totally rock bright blue lipstick. It's great. So I look to her for inspiration. <laughs> yes. Um, but so, dear Martin, is that her kind of first YA one? And she's coming out with a, I believe it's a sequel. Like, same world, but it's Dear Justice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Have you seen stuff about that? Briefly. It's not coming out for a while, but, like, still be excited. Yeah. But I, I think it's kind of, like, the after. I don't know if it's the after or the different point of view. It's been a while since I've read Dear Martin. Yeah. But. I don't know. Yeah. We'll I have to find we'll out to together. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right. Well, it looks like we're down to our last couple of minutes. So oh my goodness. Time flies. The, a good cup of tea and a good conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's any last minute things you guys want to chat with us about while we have our last couple of minutes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so what, what time are we at? We are at 57. All right. Well, we do have to go back to work eventually. But while you guys are thinking about any final thoughts you might have, we're going to give you a little preview of our March episode. Mm -hmm. Um, so our next episode is March 25th, again, at 4 o'clock, right here on Pages and Positivity. March 25th, that sounds like a <gasps> cool day. Why is it a cool it day, Gabby? It is a Gabby? cool day because it is National Reading Tolkien Day. Yeah. Yay. We're like going to celebrate. The like Hobbit. Like J.R.R. Tolkien. Yeah. Um, the Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, the world of Middle Earth. Yes. Um, so we're going to celebrate by talking about fantasy. We're going to talk about Lord of the Rings and all that good stuff, but if that's not your jam, we're going to talk about fantasy in other um, avenues of library and book world. Yes, and that so, is my jam. Yes, I... Oh, all about it. Yep. One of our co-workers, hi Mariah, uh, <laughs> does not like fantasy, so I was oh. asking her all of these things to prepare for one of our other fantasy events, and she was like, nope. Oh. <laughs> That's okay. Her jam is horror stories, so I have to go to her for learning about those. That's go. not my cup of tea. This is all the puns. Uh, <laughs> hope you guys are ready for a lot of puns here. <laughs> we were preparing of like, oh, do we need a little opener? I'm going to embarrass us. It's great. It. You know, some sort of like, good morning, America, kind of opening line. And we're like, okay, um, positivity, spill the tea, uh -huh, but I'm not 14. Hmm. Mm. And Claire was like, all I can think of is that scene in Mulan where she's meeting the matchmaker and the matchmaker goes, now, pour the tea. And then the whole, with the a sense of dignity. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to gif it, but uh, Disney's going to ping us, but yeah. So we just reenacted it for you and that was much more entertaining. <laughs> Uh, but we will. Are we? Are we at time? How are we doing? Yeah, we have a minute left. Oh, okay. So so I think our can't. time is wrapped up yeah. here. So we can sign off with the line that we did rehearse. Yes. And it's <coughs> <coughs> join us next time for another cup of positivity. positivity. Okay, Thanks, Andrew. Andrew.